Today, I want us to take a closer look at Eric Dollard's transverse and longitudinal electric waves. And in particular, I want, to, I want us to have a look at this component here that he designed that is capable of uh, generating and propagating both uh, transverse and longitudinal electric waves down a transmission line. So first I'm going to show you a clip from a video that somebody made of him talking about this, and then we will have a closer look at this, uh, this component right here. And now Eric Dollard will give a practical demonstration of analog computers in the study of transverse and longitudinal waveforms. In our analog study of electric waves, we'll start with an element of what we've been working with, which should be one pair of wires. And we'll call this the element of transmission, a differential element, as indicated by this symbol here, of an elemental length, which is either one centimeter, one inch, one foot, or one light year, depending upon what you want to take as unit length. So this is a little slice of the transmission section. This can be a little cut out of two wires of the coil or it could be the center wire, this being the shield around the coax. The direction of longitudinal flow in this element will be in this direction, and the direction of transverse flow of this element will be in this direction. And we can see these two flows occur at right angles to each other. And in the case of the Tesla extra coil, they'll perform a complex addition, and we'll end up with a spiraling wave going up around the coil. OK, now our analog of the magnetic field of the wires can be a pair of inductance coils, filter chokes or radio frequency chokes or transformer coils or anything that has the ability to store and return magnetic energy. The analog of the dielectric field will be a pair of capacitors. And these can be any form from mica to oil, depending upon exactly what you want to do. Now, when we combine these two together, then we have the analog of the complete transmission element. In either case, the energy can go this way or it can go this way. And we have one element here of our analog transmission. And we have some radio frequency inductance coils of 10 millihenries, and we have some high Q pulse capacitors of 0 0.047 microfarads. This constitutes one element of transmission. And of course, we can propagate either longitudinally or transversely, and we're going to stack these elements up to symbolize and synthesize these two forms of waves, and then we're going to get in there with some rather unique detectors and some conventional detectors, and even use our fingers and determine exactly what's going on with these things and see how this correlates with our previous measurements of actual transmission structures and not their analogs. And then we'll finally conclude with some practical applications for these devices in the transmission of electrical energy and industrial scale and also the use of producing musical sounds and some other things. So, so Eric Dollard refers to this as one uh, element of transmission. So this is the analog of, um, of a complete transmission. So this is one element of a transmission line. And he says that the analog of uh, the magnetic field is a pair of induction coils. And the induction coils stores and returns magnetic energy. And the analog of the dielectric field is a pair of capacitors. And the capacitors stores and returns dielectric energy. So this is one uh, complete transmission element and what he does is he stacks these together to create a transmission line. So in this transmission element the direction of propagation of the transverse wave is this way, is this way, and the um, direction of propagation of the longitudinal wave is this way. Okay so transverse wave is this way and the longitudinal wave uh, propagates this way. And so the standard transmission, in the standard transmission line, the inductors are, in, are wired in series and the capacitors are wired in parallel. And the propagation is in this direction and this would be uh, generating a transverse wave. 
and in the alternate transmission line, the one um, that he is that we don't use in standard or in practice, has the inductors uh, wired in parallel, and the capacitors wired in series, and the lo a longitudinal wave propagates down the transmission line. So what I find interesting about this uh, transmission line element is that the principle of incommensurability seems to be built into the system. And so, as I've talked about in previous videos, inductors and capacitors are incommensurate in principle. Uh, inductors are not capacitors. The capacitors are not inductors. Inductors store and uh, release magnetic energy and capacitors store and release dielectric energy. Uh, dielectric and magnetic are incommensurate in principle. And so in this transmission line, you can see also that the transverse wave and the longitudinal wave propagate uh, 90 degrees orthogonal to each other. And also um, in the standard transmission line, when so the inductors are wired in series and the capacitors are wired in parallel and in the alternate transmission line the uh, inductors are wired in parallel and the capacitors are wired in series and ser you know series and parallel are also incommensurate principles when something's wired in series, it's not wired in parallel. When something's wired in parallel, it's not wired in series. And so there is a lot of incommensurability built into this transmission line unit. And uh, I find that uh, really interesting. So we'll review our test set up here. What we have, we've taken our element that we've shown and compiled these in series to produce on the workbench effectively 31 miles of transverse electromagnetic transmission line. This might be the power line between the substation and load, or it might be a telephone line connecting two towns together. We have our audio oscillator. We have a stereo power amplifier hooked up for mono. And that is our generator. And we've left the end of the line open circuited, so we're dealing with a quarter wavelength similar as before. Now we have a probe for detecting magnetism, and we have a probe for detecting dielectricity. Coming to the workbench here, we have our audio oscillator. We have our power amplifier, which basically this constitutes our generator. And our magnetic detector consists of a thermo milliamp meter that has a small filament in it that gets hot when current flows through it, and then the temperature of this is measured with the thermocouple and produces a scale on the meter. These are usually considered true RMS meters. And our actual sensor here will be a little ferrite loop stick from an AM radio, and that will pick up the magnetism. What will pick up the dielectricity will be a plasma detector, or which is just a little neon bulb in this case. When we go to longitudinal waves, of course, many more possibilities will be happening, but with the transverse neon bulb is about what works. So what we're going to do is find our resonant frequency here. So the probe show, show the uh, whole transmission line that we're going to test. Oh, we're also going to see our transmission line here. We can get that on the video. There we go. Step behind it. You can lift it up and hold it up. So this is our analog of transverse electromagnetic propagation. You can see the capacitors are in shunt and the coils are in series as shown on the board. And it produces a definite geometric pattern. And of course we've got points where we can make measurement here. Now what we're going to do is determine the resonance again by measuring the dielectric potential at the end. This time we're going to use the neon ball rather than the voltmeter. Turn up our power here. And you may be able to hear the thing coming to life. So right about there's our resonance point. Harmonics from the amplifier are interfering with the results a little bit. 
We also can measure resonance by measuring the amount of magnetism at this stand. This actually proves to be a little more sensitive resonance detector. Okay, now we find this, we can actually study this wave now and its character. We can probe down the line and see the very characteristic magnetic distribution. So on our first stage here, we have a very measurable quantity of magnetism. Next stage is dropping off. Next stage is dropping down further. And so finally we get to the end, there's no more magnetism left. Now with the dielectricity, we can start from the end. Bring the bulb off of overload a little bit. And we can probe down to the next stage. It's a little weaker. And here it's not even measurable anymore. So the dielectricity has dropped off going this way, and the magnetism has gone this way. So we can see our classical distribution of magnetism and dielectricity on a TEM line, where the magnetism rises towards the low impedance source, and the dielectricity rises towards the open circuit or high impedance load end of the line. Of course, no load being hooked up at this point. So here we can see another manifestation of the principle of incommensurability between magnetism and the dielectric. In the case of the standard transmission line, the magnetism drops off as you go down the line. So the magnetism rises this way and the dielectric rises this way. So the dielectric um, strength gets stronger as you go down the line and the magnetic strength gets um, weaker as you go down the line. Okay, our test set up again. We've taken our element and rotated it 90 degrees to give us longitudinal rather than transverse flow. But of course, still using the same components in the element. We have our same amplifier. Oscillator arrangement, the amplifier is producing about the same amount of power as before, but now our distributed line looks like this. And it's a quarter wavelength long, being that we have our low impedance, high impedance. Now the length that this symbolizes is indefinite by conventional terms because this represents wave propagation in counter space, something that's little understanding of exists. The propagation in counter space would be measured in per mile or per centimeter. So we have to figure our length on that. And so little knowledge exists on that right now that we can't give a definite figure. But we can take precision measurements and determine exactly what's going on here. So right now our oscillator is at 3,600 kilocycles. That was our resonance point. Let's show the, put the neon bulb in the end here. Hold our line up so you can see how it's constructed. Get more careful now because it's much more intense, transverse than longitudinal mode. Okay, we'll do our sweep here, and you can see the resonance is extremely sharp on this. I just barely move the dial and it goes out, and the activity is so high that now it will even light a fluorescent lamp with the same amount of power. So as you can see, I only need one wire at this point, where before I had to connect up in conventional electric circuit fashion. And again, remind you, this is the same amount of power. So we can see the oscillations are much more rapid, much more intense. Now, let's study this like we did before. Let's start by seeing what our magnetism looks like. So we'll start down on the bottom here. We don't get too much indication. And it goes up there fairly well. It's quite intense there. And here, I don't even bring the thing, dare bring the thing up or I'll burn the meter out. So we see, in contradistinction to before, the magnetism is rising towards the open circuit something that doesn't normally occur with conventional electric waves. Now we'll do the dielectric part. And of course, you're probably seeing interference in the TV screen. And of course, that's, as you've seen in the other videos, is characteristic when we start to deal with longitudinal waves as they propagate quite well in space. Or in this case, we might say counter space. Now we can see the dielectricity drops right off. Now, for comparison, I'll put the neon bulb right across the line. And you can see it's just brilliant. I don't dare keep it there. It'll be going in a second. And we get quite a spark off the end of the thing, too. So for the same amount of power, this thing is operating at a much more rapid rate, much higher efficiency, and we can do a lot more things with it. 
So here you can see in the case of the alternate trans transmission line where the inductors are in parallel and the capacitors are in series that the magnetic um, strength rises as you go down the line and the dielectric strength decreases as you go down the line. So magnetic gets bigger this way, dielectric gets bigger this way. In the standard transmission line, it's the opposite. Okay, it's the opposite. Uh, the magnetic um, strength is, is stronger at the beginning of the line and weaker at the end of the line. And the dielectric uh, strength is stronger at this end and weaker at this end. So I find that really interesting in terms of the principle of incommensurability and the incommensurability between the, uh, the inductors and the capacitors and the magnetism and the dielectric. Now Eric Dollar does say in this video that the wave propagating, the wave is propagating in counter space for the longitudinal version of this um, transmission line. And I can't really say exact, I can't really explain exactly what that means. I know that question is going to come up in, uh, in the comment section. And so I'm going to tell you that I don't know exactly what that means. And it seems like Eric Dollard can't really explain it either. So I'm going to leave it at that and let you wonder what it means to propagate in counter space. Uh, maybe it looks something like this.